Today, our, jo our journey is where now? We are at uh, Kenna. And Kenna is a place that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. Kenna is a place where the later was better than the former. Do you remember Kenna? You don't remember that? And he said, where have you kept this wine since? And what, was, what does that mean? What happened last was better than what happened first. And this season of your life will be better than your previous season. Yeah. Did you understand that very well? Because you might have thought that that was the very best that could happen. And you see, well, at this age, let me just manage myself, Abby. Let me just manage the little that is coming in. But God is declaring that you are tonight at where? At Kenna, where you will do a wow. And people will say, even at this season of his life, he is more productive, he is more impactful, he is more reasonable, and he is turning around. So Kenna is the place where the latter was better than the former. But that's not where we're going. We'll talk about that. Kenna is also a place where not enough became more than enough. Am I right? Kenna is that place where, you know, you know, in your life journey, sometimes you start with nothing. Eh? Then nothing will become not enough. Abby? Not enough will, be, will become just enough. Then just enough will become, I can't hear you. More than enough. And now there's something to share. It should be you understand, Kena. Kena is that point where the little, the nothing, the not enough became more than enough. And can you key into that this time and say, Lord, I'm entering into that season in my life. I'm entering into Kena. I'm entering into Kena. Where not enough will be more than enough. Where the later will be better than the former. Where something will just happen and they wonder, how is he doing this one? Because it was that point where it was not enough. And Mary had given the news and it was like, ah, uh -uh, hey, there's nothing to take away and something happened. Kenna is that place where the insufficient became abundant. The little became sufficient. Kenna is that point. Amen. Amen. And Kenna is that point where, that place where humiliation was turned to honor. Hello? Where you have been despised, you will be celebrated. Yeah. Where they had asked you, what is it about you? What are you talking about? Where you had no voice, the Lord will give you a voice. Yeah. Because Kenna was that place where he says, everybody starts with whatever. And I'm sure the groom will be nodding his head. Humiliation was turned to honor. And so tonight, we will key into that. We are entering into Kenna, where by the grace of God, shame shall be put to shame. Did you hear that? That's where we're focusing on. Tonight, we are focusing on a place where shame was what? Put to shame. Shaming shame is what you call glory, isn't it? Shaming shame is what leads to glory. We'll be rounding off tonight by praying for glory restored. But let me just say to you that our consideration tonight is that place. The bus stop where we have reached tonight is that place where shame was put to shame. Where humiliation was changed to honor. Now, we need to understand a bit about, about the occasion, if we are going to appreciate the lessons drawn from there. We need to understand about the occasion. You know that the occasion that was focused on in John chapter 2 was called the wedding ceremony. Wedding ceremonies in ancient time Old Testament and New Testament time were happy, festive occasions. And I think it's the same thing now in Nigeria. In some parts of the world where man, man, marry man, and uh, woman, marry woman, they may not celebrate. 
In some parts of the world where the Bible is distorted, they may not celebrate. But in our own context, wedding is a ceremonial period. It's a festive period. But let me also elongate the bit because in those times, wedding was not a weekend affair. <laughs> How long did it take to wed? A week. It was a long period. And of course, the, we the period was a period where everybody that comes will need to do what? To eat, to drink, and there will be festivity. Now, you cannot say that it is a shame, big shame, for the groom's family to announce that there is nothing enough. Because what is happening is that before they are suitors, what are they saying? We cannot take care of uh, the lady we are bringing in. So there must be enough. Now, that was the occasion. Jesus was invited there. Now, but there's something very important that I need to point at there. Mary came at one time and said there was no more wine. Now, there, are, is, there have been inferences. What, what does she mean? Was it that they were not selling wine? Was it that they went to the market and they did not find wine? Now, the chances are they had the money, but the wine was not available. Because if wine was available, money would have been used to do what? To buy that. But they were in a situation in a fixed where there was no wine that would be supplied and provided for the guests that were on ground. And so, she turned to who? To Jesus. You don't recognize the story there. And he said to her, my time has not yet uh, come. And it was a glaring situation of shame. And I guess that their song at that period is, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. So she went to him, do something. Now, notice the conversation. What did he say to her? Woman, my time has not come. Abby? Woman, my hour has not come. Why did Mary have that confidence to approach him? Had he turned water to wine at home before? I can't hear you. No. No. So why did Mary summon that courage to say, now nah, I must talk to this person. I must talk to my son. She knows that he owns the key of David. And whatever he opens remains what? Open. And whatever he locks remains locked. Is the key still with him? Yes. I can't hear you very well. Yes. Will he open tonight? Yes. And whatever he shuts remain shut. And so, he answered, now, you are trying to drag me into something. I am not ready, but let me just quickly stress that intercession changes things. Do you notice that? So, my hour has not come, but for the sake of what we are doing. And let me say that you might have been wrestling with this issue and it has been all, all diagnosis, everything says the hour has not come. But because you are in Canaan tonight, the Lord will hasten the process for you in Jesus. You know, Canaan is a place of fast tracking. <laughs> you notice that? The hour has not come, yet God intervened. Because God just showed up and said, okay, because of intercession, I will do something for this one. And so, she did not answer him when he said, my hour has not come. Was he insulting? No. He was saying that you are not to give directive. It is me that determines what to be done. But because of intercession. So she turned to the people around and said, what did she say? Whatever he tells you, do it. And that's very strong. At Cana, he might give instructions that look foolish. 
Now listen very well. The instructions of God might be illogical. It may not make sense, as you will soon see. And she knew that what he would tell them to do might not be what is conventional. And so what did he say? He said to them, go and do what? Fill the, the jars there, the water, the stone things that have been carved. Go fill them up. And what did he say that she used to fill the big jars there? I can't hear you. And so what did they do? They filled that to the brim. Now we're at Kenya, we're trying to look at some truths there. They fill everything to the brim. Now, what, logically, what should have happened? What were you asking for? Hello? So what did he do? They filled the band with water. But did the water turn to wine? Did the water turn to wine at that time? And what did he say they should do? Take and take to the, the people standing there. If you were in their shoes, please listen to me. Would you obey that kind of an instruction? Hello? Would you obey that instruction? I guess you will think twice. I guess you will hesitate. Because it does not tally. We are talking about, uh, we are talking about, we are talking about uh, having more money. And you are telling me, go cook what is in your house, let me eat. Did you remember that prophet? Does that make sense? I said, the only thing left at home is the last thing for me and my, my son. And you said, go prepare it for me. What will we eat now? <laughs> no, sometimes God does not make sense. You said, I don't have enough. And he says, give me a minimum of a tithe. And someone says, ah, we have not paid our house rent. And you are talking about what? I can't hear you. You are talking about faithfulness and stewardship. No, if, if log fall on each other, which one do we carry first? Uh, the Yorubas will say, when, when tree fall upon a tree, what do you take first? You take the one at your top. And someone is now saying no. Still go back to the foundation. Now, so God sometimes does not make sense. But I guess those young men were remembering what he said. Cana is a place where obedience is tested. Whatever he says unto you, what do you do? Do it. And shame, they did. Let me fast forward. They did because we'll be considering the issue of shame a bit. They took what he had ordered and took it to the banquet, the head of the banquet. And when he tasted, they gave him water. What he tasted was wine. Something happened along the road in the journey. As you take a step of faith, something will happen. Yeah. Now, Jordan is that place where it, you don't wait until it happens before you act. You act and it will what? It will happen. Now, that's the difficulty with some people. They say, unless I see, I will do nothing. And they said, no, but you see, all the data is pointing to this, so we cannot act on this. But God has a big picture. And God has the final word. And some of you have been staying too long on that mountain. He has given you instruction long, long ago. But you are still holding forth. You want to be very convinced. Abi, you want God to make the instruction very logical. Now, if you are waiting for the logic, you will never see the greatness of God. Hello? I was sharing with you about marriage two days ago. And I told you how I appeared before that person. And when I look back at our wedding picture, I wondered what my wife saw in me that she made her marry me. My leg, my neck was like this. My, so I knew what my in-laws saw, why they decided I should not marry their daughter. In fact, if that kind of a man is to come to my house, I probably would disqualify him too. But when you take steps based on what God has said, it will end in glory. Did you hear me very well? The way to put shame to shame is not to discuss with shame. It is to act on what God has said about shame. And we'll just look at that later. And so, when they now brought the wine and the man sipped the wine, hmm, where did you get this from? I want to sing one song. It's a Yoruba song. It's two lines. 
it is our now call. Allah Rone. Have you? It is not us. It is who? It is not us. It is God. I'm sure when the man was asking them, they would say, Awana ko Oloruni. Which means, Awana ko Oloruni. Awana ko Oloruni. Jesu lo be ishe re. It is Jesus that has done what he used to do. And that will be somebody's testimony before the end of this year. When they ask you, the simple song is, it is not us. But you can personalize it. You can say, Eminako, Oloruni. Eminako, Oloruni. Eminako, To English because me and us are English. I go put them. Mm. No, be me, oh, na go do. Um. I say, no, be me, oh, na go do. significant who were about to be humiliated especially the bridegroom and his family things turned around in Cana, and it was glory that ended it now so what was the enemy at Cana? the key word is what shame psalm 25 verse 1 psalm 25 verse 1 and 2 and 3 talks about the enemy that every man will confront and that enemy was what showed up in Cana of Galilee. If we read, let's read together in verse 2. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame. Nor let my enemies triumph over you. No one, in verse 3, no one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. But shame will come upon those who are treacherous without cause. Let me not be put to shame. Shame is something that is, let me define it first before I talk about the consequences. Shame is something that reduces you. 
it is that feeling that comes upon you, that embarrassment that comes upon you, that feeling of humiliation that comes upon a person because he is failing to meet an expectation. When, when a person fails to meet expectation, the humiliation that accompanies it is shame. Shame is that thing that makes you babble when you should be talking. You know that? Shame is that thing that would be, um, um, they say, you never pay your house rent. I don't know which kind of Christian would I be. When they fight every day, isn't it? Which church would they go safe? You they beat your wife every day. Abby, say, um, um, um. Shame is what reduces a person. It is being forced to eat your words. And you know, every day we wrestle shame. Children wrestle shame. Sometimes they just feel, ah, I cannot do it because I failed yesterday. And I will talk about the consequences of, of, of shame. So that, that family in Cana was at the risk of being put to shame. Everything was working together to humiliate them. And everybody will remember the time when they wedded, when wine was what? Insufficient. Everybody will remember, oh, when we got there and it was at the peak of the ceremony, somehow they could not meet the obligation. So it was at the verge of shame. They were confronting shame because expectations was something that was, they were falling below expectation. They could not meet their expectations or the societal expectation. Shame can lead to withdrawal, isn't it? Shame often leads to withdrawal. Shame has a way of clipping the mouth of a person. Shame can make you not want to mix with other people. And it can also reduce your impact on the lives of other people. So the Kena family, were, the wedding team, were at that point. But everything changed in Kena. And my prayer for you tonight, you are in Kena, isn't it? That's our trip. We're at Kena today. Those things that are threatening you, trying to put you to shame or humiliate you, you shall see no more. Because God will rise for your family. God will rise for your children. God will rise for you. We are talking about Cana. It was a place where humiliation was threatening. And when shame comes, shame can lead to addiction. You know that? Shame can lead to addiction. There are those who will take to alcohol, isn't it? They will take to drugs. All because they want to overcome shame. They want to suppress shame. So shame can produce withdrawal. Shame can produce addiction. Shame can even make you become a gambler. This one, try this one, no work. This one, try that one, no work. Shame can make you become a nomad. Shame can reduce you. Shame, shame can bring violence. Shame can make you do things that you would not have done under normal circumstances. And shame can also make you a laughing stock for your enemies. You know, that was what the psalmist was talking about. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. If there's anybody here and they are laughing at you, they will be compelled to laugh with you. Yeah. Notice that. It was at that wedding at Cana that things changed. Many people do many things in order, in order to overcome shame. They do many, many things in order to overcome shame. Sometimes in order to overcome shame, we try to exalt. We join peer group, we join calls, and we exalt people. To, to overcome shame, sometimes we make linkage with calls and with other groups, occultic community, just because we want to overcome shame. Shame can make us do terrible things. But how did this family in this record overcome shame? I will call attention to four major things that will help us experience Cana. What is it that will help you experience Cana? In this year of divine turn around, what is it that can 
Put shame to shame and bring glory to you and to the name of the Lord and bring blessings to you. Number one is the presence of Christ himself. Hello? Can we go back to that text? John chapter 2 verse 2. Who was there? And Jesus was where? Was invited. Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding ceremony. Did they know that wine will finish? Hello? Probably they did not know. They, I'm sure they did not know. Because the invitation card was so elaborate, everybody in the community was invited. And people were coming in and drinking. But the very thing that was very important there, that you need in your life, is the presence of who? Of Christ. Now the presence makes a world of difference. The person that is backing you will determine whether you will overcome shame. Hello? Whoever is the one backing you, if the resources of heaven and earth is behind you, you are very sure that you overcome shame. You are not bigger than the one that is backing you. Right? If your Godfather is limited, then you are also limited. If his hands are short, then your hands cannot be longer. If his influence is temporal, then your influence cannot be eternal. It is important that the presence is there. And the person that was be present in your life and your party, if you will experience Cana tonight, is who? Jesus. Can you shout it very well? Jesus. You will realize that we have repeated this theme over and over and over. When we bid him by, and there are those who heard him, but for whatever reason said, no, I have, a, I have enough of him. No, he did not show up when I wanted him. No, he did not act the way I wanted him. Because they are like Naaman, they were expecting him to come and do some drama for them. And they are not really, really there with him. And so they miss it. How do we experience his presence today? It is in his word. Hello? His presence is not just mystical. It is also very available in his word. So if you want to overcome shame, your words have I hidden in my heart that I will not do what? I will not sin against you. Now, his presence must be in his word. You must desire him. Now, some people say, no, I want Christ around, but I don't have time for him. They don't study scriptures. The presence is very far from them. And if this arena is, is a cana tonight, then his words matter. Because he said, whatever he says. In other words, it is what he says that will come to pass. So whatever he says. But what if the word is not available for you? What if you are too far from the word of God? What if you have had in your heart and said, no, I don't care about what he's saying. Then of course there will be no victory over shame. So the first major factor. If shame is to be put to shame, is who? Presence. Divine presence is as essential for divine turnaround. There will be no divine turnaround without divine presence. There will be no divine presence if divine words is not there. If you are too far from the world. And I want to challenge you, sir. Challenge you, ma'am. If all that you had had to do is what people say about God's word, not what you read about God's word, then you need to come back to the Lord. Hello? There are people who should be studying, who should be studying God's word much more, divine presence. The second major thing that is important if there is going to be victory over, over shame if there is going to be a turnaround, is the ministry of intercession. Hello? Number one is what? Divine presence. The second one is what? Ministry of uh, intercession. Someone was just standing in the gap. Because every day, every day, the devil is looking for someone to disgrace. Hello? The devil is looking for someone to dishonor. He is looking for someone whose garment he will stain. He is looking for somebody who he will drag on the mud. He is looking for a family that will say, but this was not who he used to be. What happened? He is looking to say, I want to put a dent on you. But someone must do what? Must stand in the gap. 
And what did she do? Who was the intercessor in this case? I'm not using it in the Catholic sense, but I'm using it in the informational sense of what she did. What was it? She went to him and said, hey, what was it? Wine has finished. I don't know what you will do, but I know you can do all things. I know you are sufficient, and I know in you there is abundance. So I'm reporting the case to you. Now let me ask you, do you stand in the gap for your husband? And how, how often do you do that? Sometimes our complaints are much more than our intercession. Right? We see all the shortcomings in our wives. Criticism. She has not done this. She is not like Mrs. This, isn't it? Oh, no, but that was not the way we started. And we scold, we shout on our children. Not knowing that even the evil one is trying to disgrace them. And so there must be someone who says, and I remember that much about my father. He will call each one by name. Oluwa Mugbadura for Jeremiah. Father, I'm asking for Jeremiah. Every stubbornness that may be wanting to come into his life. And I'm not stubborn. But he was always being preemptive, isn't it? Every deviation and distraction that may want to come upon him. Lord, let them not overtake him. Do you lay your hands on your children to intercede for them? If there's going to be a turnaround, wine has finished because he's no longer brilliant, isn't it? Lord, I want new wine on this soul. There must be the ministry of intercession. We will be interceding in a moment. What is lost shall be found. What is stolen shall be recovered. What has been forcibly taken away, the Lord will bring back to you. The Lord will multiply. But there must be the ministry of what? Intercession. Interceding makes a world of difference. Saying, I am there to report this so that there could be a change. Was Mary reporting for reporting's sake? You know, sometimes we gossip, not intercede. Right? We complain, we gossip. Have you heard? Did you know that they are saying this about that? But what must you be doing? It is not the gossiping that solves the issue. It doesn't. It complicates matter. So what do we do? Lord, we are at a critical junction. And if you don't do anything, I am doomed. This family is doomed. So rise, Lord, and do something. What is the third thing that you find there? If there's going to be a turnaround, there must be work. It is not laziness. Hello? And you ask me how I found that. You know, some people think miracle is just to close your eyes and then money will drop in your pocket. Hello? They are lazy. You cannot overcome shame if you are lazy. You know what he said in verse 7? What did he say in verse 7? John chapter 2 verse 7. What did he say to them? He said what? Fill the jars with water. So what did they do? What, what does that mean to fill the jars? Huh? To sit down and admire what is going on? God is saying that you, you must also do what? <laughs> Walk. Rise and contribute. Do something about the situation here. Now, there are people, and it's unfortunate that the spirit that happened in Thessalonica is also being reinvented in our times. There are people who are lazy and they want to be fed. Do you find believers like that? You're not answering me. So they are not in Abuja. They are lazy. They don't walk. Or they, 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 that one, me, I cannot do that one. Now, on that wedding occasion, it was wedding, oh, you know, and what did Jesus say they should do? You better remove your wedding dress. <laughs> Go and do what? Make sure you fill that jar. If miracles will happen, then you must do your own part. It was one church father that said it. He said, without God, man cannot. But without man, God will not. Hello? Without God, man cannot. There was nothing they can do to make that water become wine. They don't have that power, except they color the water. And that will, not be, no, no, that will no longer be wine. It will be colored uh, water. So without God, man cannot. But without man, God will not. If man fails to do what he's supposed to do, God will say what? 
you are not ready for it. God may provide food for you, but God will not drop it in your tummy. You must still use your hand. Right? So, one thing is if we are going to overcome shame, I've said three things. What is number one? Can you say presence? How do we do presence? Is that okay? Or we do it this way. Is it this way or this way? Which one do you want us? We should cover it up. Presence. Holistically, presence. You need divine presence. What's the second one? How do we do intercession now? Huh? We do it this way. Okay, let's do it this way. If you're online, let's do it this way. Intercession. Or you can say, to the Lord, intercession. And what's the next one? Walk. Can you do the Let me see you walk. Some of you are tired. You should walk. Oh, yeah, roll the hand very well. How many calories are you losing? <laughs> no, that's okay. It is important that we use our gifts, use our talents, use our opportunities based on his instruction. Fill the job. And what's the last one there? You'll know that, of course. What is it? Obedience. Obedience. Even when it does not make sense. You know, sometimes God shows up and he disqualifies you from what you are doing and says, I want to qualify you for something else. Hello? I have noticed that if he, if he sets to do something in a life, there will be a dislocation, isn't it? <laughs> then there will be re relocation. Then there will be allocation, isn't it? He says, I dislocate. I relocate and I do what? Allocate. And I give you more grace. Now, that's part of being dislocated. Moving out of your comfort zone is something you must battle in your life. Hello? Because sometimes you become too comfortable to obey. And you give many excuses. I, was, I just put myself in the, in the midst of those young men. There would have been dialogue going on. Uh, have you ever seen it before that uh, we will carry water to the head of the table? And the one will say, Me, I, I need go, Abby. I'm, not, I'm not a fool. John, you should try it first. The other one said, No, Jerry, you should try it first. And I think Jerry did, isn't it? <laughs> so you should try it first. No, me, I'm not going to do that before. And so somebody just said, I remember what Mary said. I remember that we were told that whatever he tells you, do it. And obedience is a hallmark. That song captures it. When we walk with the Lord, in the light of his words, what a glory he shares on our way. When we do his good will, he says, if you have an obedience problem, you actually have a trust problem. 
If God says something and you are hesitating on acting on what you know God has said. God says jump and you say if I jump I will fall. Isn't it? What are you actually saying? You are having a trust problem not just an obedience problem. And there are many people who will never know the beauty of what God will do and his power because all that they keep seeing is that they keep restricting. They keep holding back. They keep saying, no, not now. I'll share a story and then we'll pray. It was uh, years ago, probably about 10 or so, my first child finished his secondary school, made his very good grades, and passed his jam. And my wife wanted him to go to a private university. And I said, me, I don't have money for private university. And she said that was her desire. Then you know women now, Abby? She practiced the ministry of intercession and nagging. I guess she was talking to God. That was intercession. What was the second one? And the ministry of nagging on me. And then I became so filled up in my spirit. So what do you want us to do? So we can take a loan. So I went. I took a step to where I was serving at that time. And I asked for a loan. And of course, like it is common everywhere, the authorities said, oh, we would have just done this. But you see, we don't want to set precedent. Uh, you know people are afraid of precedent, isn't it? So I said, for the fact that we don't want to set precedent, you will not get a loan. So I did not get a loan. When the authority, the person in charge who could authorize us said there was no loan, I came back into the house. And I sat that dejected. I gave the breaking news to my wife. And so that softened the idea of... Uh, but I knew she was moody. She was still reflecting. Then in the heat of... Because, you know, when there is civil war, silence reigns, isn't it? So I just turned on the television. And the television was turned to a station. Uh, it was TBN, if I remember. And there was this pastor called G.E. Patterson. I don't know him from anywhere. Don't know anything about him, but he was the one being featured. And G.E. Patterson said that unless you step into the Jordan, you will keep seeing waters. If you don't march on, Jordan will never part ways. And my wife said, Shegbo. <laughs> Did you hear? <laughs> but my faith was not carrying it. But something about what that man said kept reverberating. That this word is not accidental. And the word usually precedes the miracle of the Lord. So what we did was to say, okay, here we come at this junction. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies try over me. Remember, Lord. Remember, Lord. The sins of my youth. Okay. Remember, Lord. He will not remember. The sins of my youth. Say, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. So we gathered. We decided that Jordan we will step into. So we gathered money. All that that could do was to pay for the is it acceptance. Of, you can answer, yeah? The first thing they paid. So we paid. But after that, gradually, we started having some rakings. Somebody remembers, oh, uh, you can do this idea came. You can do that. You can put this into work. And gradually, doors were open. 
Second semester came and we paid the money seven times. Tell her, me jail By that, I mean that we were buying it. As money was coming in, we were buying and keeping. This one you must not touch. This one you must not touch. The rest is history. That child went through. That child succeeded. That child came out. Now, obedience. God may not give you all ahead. He did not change that water to wine until the currency of faith was spent. Isn't it? Until you actualize and say, I have had you, Lord. And based on your word, I have taken what? The first step. At Cana, shame was put to shame. We would pray tonight because tonight is midweek worship. And your first prayer point before we look at the issue of glory that the Lord gave to that couple. The first prayer point that we will pray tonight is that Lord, let the later part of my life be better than the former. Can you stand up on your feet and pray? Let the later part of my life be far better than the former. I stand tonight. You remember intercession changes things. That's your prayer tonight. Let the later. Let it never be a better yesterday. Let it be an ever increasing glory. I want you to pray and I want you to pray. I, I, don't, don't, don't wait. God is already. Let every succeeding day be better than the previous one. Let it be, where have you kept this wine before? Let the declaration and the judgment of history be that the latter was better than the former. I want you to pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. We are at Cana tonight. We are at Cana tonight. We are at Cana tonight. Let me increase in power of the Holy Spirit. Let it be said that with every passing day, his Christian life is better than the previous. His life of integrity, better than the previous. He's, he's a better husband, better, she's a better wife. Let, let, let it be, oh, mommy has changed. Mommy is better than she used to be. Cana is a place where what came last became better than what came first. Let the last chapter be more glorious. Let me not shipwreck my life, Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Second prayer point very quickly. Let not enough give way to more than enough. Can you just pray that? Amen. Not enough will give way to more than enough. Because they drank, they drank, they drank, they drank. Let scarcity give way to abundance. I stand tonight in, in Cana in our journey as we journey. Lord, I don't know how you will do it. But I stand to receive grace from you. That it shall be said, O oh Lord, that not enough has given way to more than enough. Make me a fountain of blessing to others. Make me overflow. Let there be an overflow through me, Lord Jesus. Let there be an overflow through me, Lord Jesus. Let there be an overflow through me, Lord Jesus. Let there be an overflow through me, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Lord, let humiliation give way to honor. Because that's where we are. We are in here tonight. Let humiliation give way to honor. Let humiliation give way to honor. Let Cana, let me experience Cana tonight. Let humiliation give way to honor upon my children, upon my life, upon our church. Let it be sure, Lord. Let humiliation, let humiliation give way to honor. I want you to pray. I want you to pray. I want you to pray. Specifically, these areas where you have been threatened by humiliation, where people are tempted to ask, Who is his God? What has he brought? What has he accomplished? Let humiliation give way to honor. Let humiliation give way to honor. Lord Jesus, you must just do something. <laughs> you must just do something. 
They were helpless at that day in Canaan, but help came. Help came because God was there. Let humiliation give way to honor. This is where we are tonight on our tour. We are at Canaan. Let humiliation give way to honor. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. At Cana, it was known that the, Jesus was the godfather of the couple. Let it be known that you are the one backing me. What, can you just pray that prayer now? Let it just be known that you are my backer, that I have you as my father. I have a father who will never, never fail me. Let it be known, I have a father who will never, never fail me. Jesus is my father. He will never, never fail me. He's rock of ages. He never, never. I have a father. I have a father who will never, never fail me. I have a father who will never, never fail me. Jesus is my father. He will never, never fail me. Rock of ages. Take that prayer point again and you tie it to a specific issue. On the issue of health, let it be sure, Lord, that you are my backer. Is it on the issue of marriage? I want you to specifically, Lord, show up for me on this matter. Let it be known that you are my Godfather, that you are the one behind me. You are the Yorubas, we say, Igile Yogba. You are the one that is behind me. You are my backer. Let it be very sure. That it is you that is commanding this matter. I am tying it to you, Lord. This is Kena. This is Kena. You showed up for the couples. They were not put to shame. Show up for me, Lord. Let it be obvious that you are the one backing me on this issue, on this matter. Let it be very sure, Lord, that I have you. That it is you. And so I, I am talking. Let it be sure that you are the one. Put shame to shame on this matter. Put shame to shame on this matter. Put humiliation to shame on this matter. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Everything ended in glory for that couple. And we pray on glory. I will take five issues. Every lost glory. And you wrote, remember that there is Ichabod, isn't it? In 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 20, the Bible talks about Ichabod. So you will say, these people ended in glory. That's what we are tapping into in Canaan. Every glory that had been lost, Father, restore in the name of Jesus. Oh, I pray in the name. Every glory that I have lost, every glory that sin and Satan had taken away, every aspect that is Ichabod in my life, in the larger family, every lost glory, Lord, I'm asking that at Cana it will end in glory. Restore every lost glory. Restore every lost glory. Restore every lost glory. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Second thing about glory. Glory can be stolen. Glory can be exchanged. Glory, others can use manipulation. And you remember that in Kings, first Kings chapter 3, one woman stole another woman's son. But a Solomon rose and got back her child for her. Lord, I write, choose your servant, send a helper my way. Every stolen glory, retrieve them for me in the name of Jesus. Retrieve every stolen glory. The record in Cana ended in glory. So for every stolen glory, 
every exchange of glory, everything that had been taken away manipulatively, deceptively, cunningly, Lord, bring back, bring back, bring back, bring back, bring back. Pray and pray and pray and pray that every stolen glory shall be returned, shall be retrieved. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. The third one that you will take is that glory can even fade. We talk about fading glory. And there are those who say, oh, yesterday was better than today. They will say, if you know her before, if you know him before. But for this family, it was not that way. Father, do not let the glory of my life fade away. Can you just pray that? I want you to pray against fading glory. I will not diminish in righteousness. I will not diminish in honor. I will not diminish in grace. I will not diminish anywhere. Do not let me experience fading glory. Do not let me experience fading glory. Please, Lord, don't let me experience fading glory. In at Cana, it ended in glory. At Cana, it ended in glory. At Cana, it ended in glory. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. When that text, that text that we read was rounding up, John chapter 2 verse 11 said, this was the first sign, isn't it? It was an unveiling. You know, sometimes glory can be veiled. And uh, sometimes when there is a veil, you don't see the substance. You don't see the thing that is the treasure behind it. And so you will say to the Lord, tear every veil that is concealing my glory. Pray in the name of Jesus. Tear every veil, every veil, every veil that is concealing my glory. They are torn, they are torn, they are torn, they are torn. Tear every veil, every veil that is concealing the glory of my life. Let them be torn. Tear every veil. Remove every veil that is concealing the glory of my life. Remove every veil, every veil. Let there be an unveiling. Let there be an unveiling of glory. This was the first sign that you performed. Let there be an unveiling of the treasure you have deposited in me. Unveil the glory. That was Cana. Cana is a story of shame turning to glory. Story Cana is shame turning to glory. In Jesus' name we have prayed. And the last one, and you call on the name of Jesus very passionately. Paul talks about ever increasing glory. Where every passing day it keeps getting better. Where they think it should be stopped and it keeps manifesting. And you say, Lord, this is my season of ever-increasing glory. Can you shout the name of Jesus and turn down to prayer? Jesus! Let this be a season of ever-increasing glory. Ever, 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 ever. <laughs> ever-increasing glory. Shout he Jesus is here. Ever-increasing glory. It keeps getting better. It keeps getting sweeter. It keeps getting stronger. Yes, this is a season of unveiling and ever-increasing glory. Turn around, turn around, turn around. In Jesus' name we have prayed. And so, Lord, I stand in the gap this night for your church and your children. And I say, Lord, the later shall be more glorious than the former. Amen. I declare that not enough will be more than enough. Amen. I declare that humiliation will give way to honor. Amen. Shame shall give way to glory. Amen. Every lost glory is recovered. Amen. Every stolen glory is retrieved. Amen. The glory shall not fade. Amen. I declare on the authority of the Lord that there is an unveiling going on. Amen. <laughs> because Cana was a place of unveiling. 
And so tonight, your glory is unveiled. Amen. And on the authority of the Lord, I declare, it shall be ever increasing glory. Amen. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Somebody shout glory.